Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the LDL receptor. Okay, so just to remind you where we've got up to at the moment. Basically, uh, we have seen that LDL uh, molecules are these remnants of VLDL molecules. Okay, so the liver makes VLDL molecules to supply the skeletal muscle tissue and the cardiac muscle tissue with triacylglycerol molecules even when you are in the fasted state. Okay, and these VLDL molecules are very large lipoprotein molecules with a huge great store of triacylglycerols within their lipid core here. However, as they deliver these triacylglycerols to the skeletal and cardiac muscle tissues, what's going to gradually happen is you're going to deplete the triacylglycerol uh, content of these VLDL molecules. As you deplete uh, the triacylglycerol content of these VLDL molecules, they become known as intermediate density lipoproteins, and then finally, once you've got rid of pretty much all of the triacylglycerol molecules, they become these low density lipoproteins, LDL molecules. Okay, so. LDL molecules are much smaller than VLDL molecules. They're between 20 and 25 nanometers in length, and they have only one apolipoprotein within their phospholipid monomer, which is apolipoprotein B100, which is an enormous great apolipoprotein. Okay, right. Now, in the phospholipid monomer, they'll have a lot of uh, free cholesterol molecules, and they'll also have uh, cholesterol esters uh, in their lipid core. And this is why a lot of the media will refer to these LDL molecules merely as cholesterol, because even though they're not just a single cholesterol molecule, they have a large uh, content of cholesterol. So really, they're uh, just full of cholesterol. Right, uh, so we now want to see how are these uh, low-density lipoproteins going to be uptaken into cells, okay? And for that, we're going to need to discuss the LDL receptor. Okay, so what we're going to firstly do is discuss the structure of the LDL receptor. Then we're going to discuss the synthesis and the trafficking of the LDL receptor. We'll then discuss the receptor-mediated endocytosis of the LDL receptor. And then uh, what's going to happen to the cholesterol once uh, the whole uh, LDL molecule has been uh, endocytosed. Okay, so let's start off then with the low-density lipoprotein receptor. And for short, people will often denote the low-density lipoprotein receptor merely as the LDLR. Okay, so if you see people referring to the LDLR, they just mean the low-density lipoprotein receptor. Okay, right. So let's start off with uh, the amino terminal domain of this protein. So basically, the low density lipoprotein receptor is a transmembrane protein. It has a single membrane spanning alpha helix. Okay, so to draw just a very simple picture, like so, basically you have the amino terminus extracellularly and the carboxylic acid terminus is intracellularly. Okay, uh, so Basically, there is a single membrane spanning alpha helix, and there's a large extracellular domain and a small cytoplasmic tail. Okay, so let's start off with the uh, extracellular domain. So, we'll start off with the amino terminus up here. Okay, and the first uh, domain that you have uh, within this uh, LDL receptor protein is a domain known as the LDL receptor type A repeat domain. Okay, and basically this domain contains seven repeated structures, and it's very important in the binding uh, to the LDL molecule. Okay, so here it is, like so, and uh, this has seven repeats within it. So I'll have repeat one, repeat two, repeat three, repeat four, repeat five, and then repeat six. So this is R1, R2, R3, R4, so you repeat a very similar domain many times basically as you go along R5, R6, and R7. Okay, right, uh, so this is what's known as uh, the LDL receptor, 
Okay, so the LDL are type A repeats domain. Okay, and basically, um, this is the domain which is going to bind to the apolipoproteins within the LDL molecule, specifically this apolipoprotein um, B100. Okay, so this is the LDL R type A repeat domain. Okay, now after the LDR um, type A repeat domain, uh, what you then have is a domain known as the epidermal growth factor homology domain. And this contains three domains which have a structure uh, which are homologous to a domain that you find within the epidermal growth factor precursor. Okay, so let me show these. So, here's one, here is the second one, and then in between the second and third one of these uh, domains, which is homologous to the epidermal growth factor precursor, what you have is a special structure known as a beta propeller, which I'll just draw it like that. Okay, and then you have the third one down here. So this entire domain here, the whole thing, is called the epidermal growth factor, or EGF for short. So this stands for uh, the epidermal, that's the E, and then GF is for growth factor. Okay, so this is the epidermal growth factor uh, homology domain. Okay, so homology domain. And it really contains these three separate domains, which are all homologous to a domain that you would find within uh, the epidermal growth factor precursor protein. Okay, so let's colour these in. So here's one, here's two, and here's the third one. Now let's discuss this beta propeller in a bit more detail. So this is what's known as a six-bladed beta propeller. Okay, so let's draw a little bit of a bigger picture of what a beta propeller looks like. So basically, beta pleated sheets are where um, proteins fold up like so. It's a secondary uh, amino acid structure where you have proteins folded like so. Okay, and generally they form these sort of sheets known as beta plated sheets. And this interaction is held together uh, by uh, bonds between uh, the peptide links on uh, parallel strands, basically. So this is a beta pleated sheet. So basically, what a beta propeller is, is it's made out of um, beta pleated sheets. Okay, and ours is going to have six blades. So let me show you what the structure of a blade is. So basically, what you have is a structure like so. Okay, this is what is meant by a blade of a beta propeller. So basically, it's a beta pleated sheet where the um, strands that are running in parallel to one another are gradually getting longer as you go up. Okay, so you're sort of getting this triangle like shape. Then what happens is you'll go into the next one of these beta pleated sheets. Okay, so here is the next beta pleated sheet. Then you'll have another beta pleated sheet, like so. Okay, and this will form another blade of the propeller. And then another one, like so. And we want six of them, so we might as well finish it off now. So there's four. And then we'll have uh, the fifth one. And then finally, the sixth one here. Okay, like so. So you can now see that we've sort of got this propeller shape. And each one of these um, structures, each one of these sort of triangles made up of a beta pleated sheet is known as a blade of the propeller. Okay, so um, you have one of these structures within this epidermal growth factor homology domain that sits in between the second and the third one of these homologous domains to the epidermal growth factor precursor protein. Okay, and this is known as a six-blade, oh dear, and I've <laughs> drawn right across where I want to put the rest of this receptor. I don't know how I'm going to fix that. Okay, so this is a six-bladed um, beta propeller. Okay, right. Uh, and you see beta propellers in many other proteins as well. It's not just in uh, LDL receptors. Right, okay, so that's what that structure that I've denoted there by that sort of uh, six, well, that sort of star structure there. Okay, right, so 
after the epidermal growth factor homology domain, I'm going to have to sort of take it round here. Uh, it should be just below, of course, if I was having the perfect picture, but never mind. Okay, uh, the next domain that you have down is something known as the O-linked glycosylation domain. Okay, so this is the O-linked glycosylation domain. Okay, and basically this domain contains a lot of serine residues which can be glycosylated. Okay, so let me show you the structure of a serine residue and then we'll discuss what it means to glycosylate that. Okay, so uh, the structure of a serine residue then. Uh, I'll draw, well, when, when I say I'm going to draw a serine residue, what I mean is I'm going to draw the serine amino acid as though it's within a polypeptide, okay? So I'm not just going to draw the pure amino acid, I'm going to draw it as though it's within a polypeptide. So, here's the amino group, as though it's bound to the carboxylic acid group of the amino acid prior to it. Then we have the alpha carbon, which will have a single hydrogen coming off it. Then we have the carboxylic acid group down here, which will be linked to the amino group of the next amino acid along. Okay, so this is the core amino acid structure. All amino acids have this same uh, structure here. Okay, then the R group of a serine amino acid is specifically a methylene group with then an alcohol group coming off it. Okay, so this is serine. So basically what you can do is in this O-linked glycosylation domain, you have a lot of these serine residues, and you can add carbohydrate groups onto the side of these uh, serine residues, so you can bind them onto the alcohol groups. Now, when you bind carbohydrate groups onto a protein, that is called glycosylation. So glycosylation means binding glycosyl, or sugar groups, onto the sides of proteins. O-linked glycosylation means that you've added them onto an oxygen atom, okay? And that means that we've added them onto this oxygen atom of the serine residues here. So that's why this is called the O-linked glycosylation domain, because these serine residues that are within that domain are going to be glycosylated on their oxygen atoms. Okay, right. After that, you have the membrane-spanning alpha helix. So you have this single membrane-spanning alpha helix, which will make its way across the phospholipid by there. And then you have a small cytoplasmic tail. And the really important domain that you have within the uh, cytoplasmic tail is called an NPXY domain. Okay, and then finally you'll have the carboxylic acid terminus of this LDL receptor. Okay, right. So, let's discuss this MPXY domain in a bit more detail because this is going to be crucial to the endocytosis of this receptor once LDL has bound to the LDL receptor type A repeat domain. Okay, so, basically what this the naming of this domain is telling you is which four amino acids you have. So this domain that I have highlighted in green, this only consists of four amino acids within this cytoplasmic tail. And the, the naming of it just tells you exactly which four amino acids you have. Okay, so in order to be able to read this, you need to know uh, your single letter amino acid code. Okay, so what it's saying is the first amino acid of this domain is N. Okay, so what does N stand for? Well, N basically means the amino acid asparagine. Okay, so I'll just write that down. N is the single letter amino acid code for asparagine. Okay, so let's draw this um, domain out. So the first amino acid is going to be asparagine. So I'm just drawing out a normal amino acid residue here. So this is the core structure. Now what's the R group for asparagine? Well basically asparagine has a two carbon carboxylic acid which is um, has been turned into a primary amide. So it's aspartic acid basically where you have replaced the alcohol group with an amine group like so to create an amide group here. Okay, so you have a methylene group and then a primary amide group here, and that's asparagine. So that's the first amino acid of this domain. The second one is a proline residue. 
OK, right, so let's draw our proline residue here. So proline is unusual because the R group involves the nitrogen atom of the amino acid. OK, so you don't have a hydrogen coming off this uh, nitrogen of a proline residue. OK, you do still have a hydrogen coming off the uh, alpha carbon. And then you'll have your carboxylic acid group here. And now the R group of proline is basically you have a five-membered well, five ring here. So here we go. So when I put CH2 like that, that means you've got two hydrogens coming off each of these carbons. So you add in these three extra carbons to form this five-membered ring here, and then each of these carbons here has two hydrogens coming off. So this is P, and this stands for proline. Right, uh, X. The little x just means any amino acid can sit in that position there. So I'll just put an arbitrary amino acid. So here is the amino group again. Here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off. And we'll have here our R group. So it's just any old amino acid. You can have whatever you like in that position. And this will still work to do what it needs to do later. OK, and then the final amino acid in our little MPX domain is a Y. Now, Y stands for tyrosine. So, again, here is our amino group, here is our alpha carbon, and here is our carboxylic acid group. OK, and then the R group of tyrosine consists of a methylene group with a benzene ring coming off it, like so. OK. And then off that benzene ring, you then have an alcohol group. OK, so this is the R group of a tyrosine amino acid. OK, so uh, this is Y, and this stands for tyrosine. So basically, in the carboxylic acid terminus of uh, the LDL receptor, you have one of these special MPXY domains. And these are involved in the receptor-mediated endocytosis of the LDL um, receptor, which is bound to LDL. OK, so I'll just put that this is this arbitrary amino acid, so MPXY. OK, and this special domain is what you would call an endocytic motif. So there are um, different examples of endocytic motifs, OK? This is not the only type of endocytic motif, but it is a common form of endocytic motif. So basically, what an endocytic motif is, is a little motif, which is a little section of the protein, which tells uh, components uh, of the cytoplasm, so proteins within the cytoplasm, that this receptor needs to be endocytosed. OK, right. And uh, the binding of the LDL is going to trigger some sort of conformational change in the LDL receptor that will mean that this NPXY uh, motif is then available for the proteins to interact with, basically, and they will then cause the endocytosis of the uh, LDL-bound LDL receptor. OK, right. So we'll call it there for this video. And in the next video, what we'll discuss is the production of the uh, LDL receptor within the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the trafficking of it to the plasma membrane, and then what happens when uh, an LDL molecule binds to that type A uh, LDL receptor repeat domain, and um, then how receptor-mediated endocytosis follows.